Welcome everyone to the December meeting of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society's Astrophotography SIG meeting. I always get lost in there somewhere. That is that is so long. So it is great to have you all here tonight. And this is also our last event of the year. So before I forget, I just want to thank everyone that has joined us throughout the year online. I know it's been difficult. We're going to be online for a while longer. So just uh Bear with us, trust me, if we could meet in person, we would. So without any further ado, we have a, another wonderful speaker tonight. And this is someone I've known for quite some time. I first met him at a Kalamazoo Astronomical Society general meeting in the old Hans Baldoff Planetarium, which was uh, part of the Kalamazoo Public Museum when they were on the second floor of the Kalamazoo Public Library building. So for those of you that have been in the KS, this is a long time ago. And so he joined uh, the KAS uh, like roughly a few months before I did. We both joined in 1994. And he came on the board in 1995 as the newsletter editor. And then he was a member at large for a time. And then after a while, he uh, got busy with life and dropped off for a bit. Around 2003, 2004, he came back briefly, but then went away again. And now he's moved back in the Vicksburg area and has joined us again. And as long as I've known him, he's always had a, a strong interest in astrophotography. I can remember many nights uh, uh, doing observing or imaging uh, in his front yard in Vicksburg. And then we uh, did lots of uh, imaging at Astropad, owned by a former KS member, Dave Moore. He even uh, rented a computer one time when he, quote, uh, field tested a CCD camera. And we were working with that in my uh, uh, driveway here. Uh, I, I don't know why we did it here, considering how light polluted it is here. So he's always had a long vested interest in imaging. And tonight he'll be talking about how to use uh, Sequence Generator Pro for automated imaging. So without any further ado, Pete, take it away. Sorry, there we go. Sorry. Thank you, Richard. Uh, let's see here. Let me share my screen off. Okay. And then. I have done this before. Whoops. Are you guys seeing the slideshow? Uh, Richard? Yes. Oh, you are. Okay, good. Okay, great. So thank you, everyone, for uh, coming. Um, tonight, I'm going to be talking about Sequence Generator Pro, which is one of the numerous um, imaging automation programs that is out there now. Um, there's, a, there's a few of them, actually, compared to what it was even a handful of years ago. Um, so we're actually in a really fortunate time to be doing um, imaging where you have the ability to you know, automate your imaging where you can, you know, sleep at night or observe or do other stuff, you know, or even attend to multiple uh, imaging or even do stuff remotely, you know, from far away as the KAS has a remote scope too. So tonight I'm going to focus in on Sequence Generator Pro. Um, I've used that now probably for five years, I believe, five or six years. I started using it when I think they were on version two. So um, here, this talk, I'm going to be using, I use primarily version 4.0, um, 0.068, actually, technically. They had just moved over to four. Um, a lot of people I know are still on 3.1. Um, that's still a good version if it's stable. Um, definitely still use it. So a lot of stuff I'll talk about is applicable. Um, they are working on 4.1 as a beta. There's some exciting new stuff in there. There's still a beta. So if you're adventurous, go for it. Um, so yeah, so um, here we go. The, um, it allows us to do you know, hands-off collection of data all night long, or in my case, or a lot of people's cases, you want to collect a lot of data and you only have so many hours a night, especially in the summertime, you might only get three, four hours a night. So, and, and nowadays you see a lot of people imaging and they're collecting 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 hours worth of data per object. 
And so to be able to do so, you need to be able to go back to an object night after night after night um, or collect multiple objects each night. So automation really is the way to do it. Um, but to be able to do that, you got to have it set up. You got to be able to do certain tasks um, repeatedly, um, you know, and it just has to work. So we're going to kind of go through Sequence Generator Pro, all the areas you really do need to have set up. But first, you got to have the hardware. I mean, to really to do imaging um, with automation, there are some basic hardware requirements, um, starting with the mount, because whether it was the film days or with CCDs or CMOS cameras or DSLRs, um, you do need a solid mount. And for automation, you, you need a, a go-to capable mount. Um, mostly you'll see people using equatorial mounts. Um, you could use an alt azimuth mount. So I know there are some out there um, that are alt azimuth that have like derotators. Um, they're definitely more higher end, more advanced. Um, not, you don't see a lot of people using those, but they are out there. Um, but definitely go to capability. So obviously, so you can put in the court. So you could, you know, put coordinates in into the software and it can slew off to whatever your object is. Um, and it be an ASCOM compatible. ASCOM is the standards based um, for an astronomy. So basically it's a communication package between devices and software. So you can, um, and I know I'm messing up <laughs> how to describe it. Um, even what the acronym is, but being an ASCOM compatible um, mount, and pretty much most of them are, whether it's, um, you know, you can get an Atlas mount, um, Astrophysics, Celestron makes them. Um, most mounts out there that you buy will be ASCOM compatible. You just got to go to the website or maybe there's a third party that produces them. Um, next up is your camera. Um, usually you'll want to get ASCOM um, compatible, obviously, drivers. Um, SG um, Pro does support some native drivers, um, ZWO. Um, it's not, I guess it depends on the camera, so you just really have to check with it. Obviously, you could use uh, mono um, one-shot color, um, even some um, the DSLR cameras are supported. Cam Canon, Nikons are the, probably the two main ones I can think of. Um, and I've, I, for doing automation, if you, you could use a non-cooled one, but probably for optimum results, you definitely want cooled. Um, next up, your auto guider. You definitely, obviously, need an auto guider to keep pinpoint stars. Um, obviously, there, there's also really high-end mounts that can do modeling and you know unguided. I mean, totally you know, hands off. Um, there's plane wave astrophysics that have like absolute uh, encoders. Um, they do work, but for the vast majority of the people, you need an auto guider. Um, super sensitive, obviously, if you could like a Lodestar, um, ZWO makes some really nice ones. Um, you want to be super sets, you know, set sensitive, large field of view, uh, and have a solid setup. You know, you don't want to have differential flexure because otherwise you could be look like it's perfect guiding, obviously. And then and you get your frames all of a sudden you got squiggly lines going everywhere. So whether it's a guide scope, a finder scope, um, or an off-axis guider, you just want to make sure it's a really solid setup. And for this talk, um, most people are, are going to be using a PhD for their guiding package. And that's what I use. Um, that's probably the most dominant. Uh, guiding package. Um, SGP does support a few other packages like MetaGuide. Um, oh yeah, and there's a couple other ones, but vast majority of people will use that uh, PhD. Uh, it's a great package. They're, it's actively developed. It's um, really robust. And then finally, the focuser, obviously for autofocusing. Um, you got to have sharp stars. Um, you want it to be autofocused throughout the night. So you want to have a very accurate focuser. Um, we're talking like, you know, Crawford focusers, um, some rack and pinion focusers can be very accurate too, especially if you're carrying a, a really heavy imaging train with like big, big, uh, um, you know, filter wheel, uh, CCD camera, especially if you have an older CCD camera that weighs, you know, you're talking like a 10, 15 pound 
imaging train. You probably want a rack and pinion possibly to help support it. But, um, and then obviously uh, ASCOM compatible. Um, uh, there's Optech makes them, uh, Feather Touch. There's quite a bit of manufacturers out there that do have focusers and even some focusers have like built-in rotators. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff out there, but you definitely having the hardware does help a lot. Obviously, it kind of goes kind of the rule of thumb to kind of you can depends on how much fiddling around you want to do. Some people like to play around with the stuff and get the best out of um, the equipment, even if it, you know, felt spending a million dollars. Basically, some people just want to bypass all the fiddling around and they'll throw the money at it. You can you can get it to work. I started off with a, a, a CG uh, M. Uh, mount from Celestron, you know, it was a thousand dollar mount. And I got some pretty good results for a long time off there with a eight inch F4 reflector and basic auto guider did some really good results. Um, and I've worked myself up to an astrophysics mount. Um, and, you know, so I've been through the whole range. So um, what areas are we need to set up in SGP to um, make it work? Um, one of the main areas that we need to work on is, you know, you have to tell the software what you have to, you know, what's your equipment. So you do that with the equipment manager um, and, and that is the default. So um, you're going to be just basically storing it in there. So every time if you, um, you know, start up a new, what's called a sequence, it would take the default or you can pick it because if you have multiple setups, maybe a wide field setup or one you travel with, you can have these things pre predefined. Um, and there's an area we'll show, I'll show you called the control panel where you can make tweaks like, you know, in session. Um, so you got to be able to define it. we got to set up the plate solving to be able to do like automatic centering or automatic go-tos. Um, you know, if you're going to be doing multiple objects a night, uh, meridian flips, you know, so if you're imaging on the west side and it comes up and you want it to flip around automatically, and be on or be on the east side and automatically flip, you got to be able to plate solve. Honestly, you know, obviously if you have a super accurate mount, it doesn't matter, but most people you really do need to have plate solving to work. Um, auto focusing, that is typically a lot of people get hung up on there. Um, sometimes it's a, it can be, the settings are, can, can be very critical, um, but getting the auto focusing going, um, is um, it's just a matter of, like I said, it's getting the parameters set up, knowing your setup, your the specifics of your setup. Because um, if you're focusing a, a real long focal length instrument, uh, the critical focus zone is going to be quite a bit bigger than, say, a uh, real fast um, F2 or F3 uh, refractor or Newtonian. Um, auto guiding, same thing there. You know, got to put in, it's me more configuring. Um, in SGP, you'll be more like, uh, you know, dithering stuff, um, that kind of stuff. But there's also configuring PhD to be able to allow the two softwares to communicate with each other. And for S and, and for PhD, if you're new to obviously all of this, you got to know how to touch lightly on PhD on how to actually get that set up properly. Um, the sequence itself, we're going to talk kind of cover that area where that's the actual plan you're going to be doing for the night or over multiple nights. You can program your multiple targets in there and within each target, what are you going to do? Are you going to shoot red filters, you know, green, blue, um, your narrow band filters? Um, are you going to do uh, calibration? Um, there's a few things. And then finally, sequence recovery. If we're talking automation hands off, you want to be able to handle it because if you're going to be sleeping, what happens when a cloud passes through there? You know, what do you want the system to do if that happens? Or if you have a sky monitoring um, device like a Boltwood or a Sky Alert, you know, if it detects clouds, you know, what do you want the system to do if you have a, and if you're, if you're in an observatory, you want the roof to close, you know, when it clears up, you want to reopen back up and start imaging again. So, okay. Um, I am, boy, I'm trying to see how I can do this. Um, so the equipment manager setup. I thought I had a picture of the actual, let me see here. If anyone has any questions as I'm going, feel free to stop me and ask a question. I do have my session from my, my observatory computer online and going right now, so I could pull that up and I do plan to jump over to it 
um, especially with the equipment manager here, because this would be a good thing to show. So in the equipment manager, this there's tabs, which I'm just gonna switch over here real quick. Um, camera, filters, your focuser, your telescope, your plate, you know, everything that I talked about there. Um, and I'm just gonna switch, the, whoops. All right, I just broke it, so my bad. Um, here we go. Okay, so it's in the menus under tools and it's called Equipment Profile Manager. And this is what it looks like. So you got all your tabs for all your uh, various things, your cameras, your filters, the various things, and it's all defined here. So for instance, this one, like I said, you do this for each one of your setups. So for this, this is my um, AtTech um, uh, 383L plus mono camera. It's a 8300 base, real popular mono camera. It's for my eight inch Ritchie scope um, with the thin off axis guider. Um, now the same setup, I have a, you know, a different setup for my, my 61 millimeter um, refractor. So it's gonna have slightly different, like the focal lengths are different. So I'm gonna have slightly different settings. A lot of times they're similar settings because obviously my filter wheel is the same. The camera itself is the same. So you can actually do, um, you can actually type over this and then save it off and have, you know, kind of make use of what there. So we're just gonna cover like right here. So like with the camera, things that you gotta put in there is like your, um, you know, it'll show like your, if you do your drop down menu, everything, like I said, um, you gotta have ASCOM for your camera. So when you get your camera and you hook it up to your observatory computer or laptop, you will obviously install the d manufacturer's um, drivers. So you're usually gonna include ASCOM drivers and whatnot. And then in this drop down list, you'll start seeing them. So for me, I'm gonna, I pick my, my, my camera that's in there. And, uh, and then now when I actually load up the, um, the, uh, the, you know, when I get, go to use this, uh, this, this sequence, it'll know which camera I'm going to use. And then you can go in here and you can tell it when, when you connect, what do you want it to cool down to right off the bat? You know, mine, for me, I go down to minus 20. I found that throughout the year here in Michigan, I can get the minus 20 99.9%. .9%. There's a couple of nights a year where I just can't, uh, it'll get to like nine, minus 19 and it's like, okay, I can't, it's not going to work tonight. Um, and you can also have it set up to do it gradually too. You can say, hey, get me to minus 20 over 10 minutes. If you're worried about it ramping down too fast, you could tell it, hey, just cool it down over the next 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half hour, whatever you want. And then same thing, when you're actually done with the night, you can have it automatically shut down. You can have it warm up too gradually warm the camera up, especially if you have a bigger chip and you worry about thermal shock, you can configure it here. Um, and then here, obviously there's the checkbox, cool down on the camera connect. So when you actually connect your camera, you know, it sets it up, uh, cool down on sequence. So there's a whole bunch of commands here that you can set up. Now you put your pixels in here, which is important because this is gonna come in handy for the plate solving. You gotta tell it how big your, this is basic information you'll get out of your manufacturers, you know, what you know about your camera. Your pixel scale or your scale, this is what the combination of the focal length of your scope and your, the pixel, you need to know what your, your pixels are and the, and the, um, the, uh, the micron size of your, of each pixel on the camera side is. You can go, there's a few calculators online that you can go to and punch in like the focal length. And you can put it in there initially for a rough guess because later on when you actually do a plate solve, it'll actually populate this. You can actually get a, an actual accurate number and then you can come back here and actually put a really accurate number so that your plate solves will know, hey, this is the scale that this picture is at. And so, um, it's really, really handy and really important that the plate solving knows what, you know, what's going on there. Um, download times. I found that this is really helpful for like, um, when you're actually imaging, it's going to tell you account, it's going to tell you, say, hey, you got, you know, five hours left in your, you know, your imaging run, your, your whole sequence. And it's going to take a look at, hey, you got, you know, five, 
you know, or 25 five minute exposures left. And, and it's using that downloads time too. It's saying, oh, okay, you're gonna take, you know, pictures and there's download times. It's using that to help calculate how much time you have left. Um, you can sit there and go, you know, one Mississippi, two Mississippi and kind of guesstimate it. Or if you really do know what the download time, it's gonna vary on each system. I don't think there's any specs. As, I mean, if you have like USB hubs, it depends on, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Anyway, enough talk about the cameras. We can go to filters. Um, other stuff um, on this tab, uh, I'm trying to see here, the camera gains, um, ED, you could put this stuff in here. Um, this stuff will, on here on this image statistics, if you put the, the camera gain and stuff in here, like the 0.6 uh, minus E, I got that off. The, actually, you can actually go and like, uh, the manufacturer will have them, but you could also like in Pix Insight, some other packages, calculate your gains and stuff. And when you do that, it'll actually use it to do this ideal exposure time, which kind of helps you. It's not, I don't want to say it's not giving you the, the perfect answer, but it'll kind of give you a ballpark saying based on your sky conditions and, and what filter you're using and all this other stuff, this is what your exposure, you know, an ideal exposure time should be. Yeah, is it good? Yeah, it can it can be useful if you're getting new to this and you're kind of you know trying to figure out where you're doing for exposures. So uh, filters, same thing. Um, when you load your filter wheel, you'll pick it here. Um, you'll do your set filters. It brings up in here, and this is where you define them all. Um, I have all all my filters in here. I got a big filter wheel, so I got my luminance, blah blah blah, all my stuff in here, and I allow them to use them. Autofocus exposure, this is really important, especially when you're doing autofocusing. Um, if you, there's two ways you can autofocus. When you auto, obviously when you autofocus, it'll use what filter you're using, but you can also tell it to say, hey, go use this other filter. But if you're using it like on, hey, use whatever filter is in there and autofocus with that filter, you could tell it to say, hey, you know, if a red filter or an, especially the narrow bands that, hey, those, those guys need some serious exposure. So like, you know, my luminance, say I use a 10 second exposure just to make sure I get a lot of stars. I could probably use a two second exposure if I'm with my, um, you know, this is very dependent on your scope. Because if I'm doing an, an, eight, an F8 scope versus an F4 scope, there's a big difference. You just gotta know what you're doing. But, you know, an H alpha might be a 60 second exposure um, this is a bad example because I don't have this populated, but that's that's what this is used for. Um, your focus points, you can actually go in there and actually tell it to where the, if you want to put your focus points in there for where that is. If you have a super like an observatory setup, um, and then for flats, um, you can go in there and you can tell it. So if you use like when you um, do your calibration frames. You can tell it that hey, when when you pick a, a flats in your sequence, and you pick one by one, it'll automatically say, oh, okay, for uh, for my luminance, my type two C, which is uh, astronomics filters I'm using, for one by one, it's going to populate with a three point six two second exposure, and my I have a flat box actually, it'll actually turn the brightness on my box up to three on its scale, and it populates it with twenty five flat frames, so really handy that you can do this kind of stuff because you can go in there and for one by one, two by two, all the various ones. So you can go out there ahead of time on a full moon night, a cloudy night, whatever, go in there and figure out what your um, flat frame exposure times are and go in there and just populate them right here. So next time you're out, especially if you're tired in the morning, you don't want to remember trying to figure out, hey, what was the exposure time? It's already done for you, especially if your setup is really the same each time. Next up, your focus. Um, same thing here, you're going to be setting up your, um, you know, picking your focuser out of there. Um, your focuser step size, this is more used for like manually focusing. You're just going to tell it how many, um, you know, step sizes of whatever your controller is. That's going to be very dependent on your, on your focuser. Uh, some focusers might have a hundred thousand steps and some might only have 7,000 steps. My, my Optech has only 7,000 steps in it, whereas my, um, my uh, Senso, it has does have like you know ten or twenty thousand steps. It's a big diff, or no, actually more than that's like a hundred thousand. It's huge. So there's a big difference. Um, then then you can go in here to uh, put focuser reminders. If you don't have an auto focuser, but we're talking automation, so we're not going to handle that. 
Um, auto adjust focus per filter. If you don't have para, parafocal focusers, you could focus with your, say your luminance filter, switch it back to the red. And if you pre-calculated that, hey, the red filter is actually three steps or 10 steps or whatever the number is different than your one filter, you can have it adjust automatically for you. Um, you can do that kind of stuff, which is good for automation because then you don't have to deal with that stuff. If you're going for the most optimum setting, it's a good automation tool to have. And there's tools that you can use to help figure this stuff out. Um, but then um, set, uh, use autofocus. This is uh, the, probably the biggest thing you want to set up for, for automation. Um, we do have a slide coming up that's going to dig into these settings, but you can go in here and it's going to be different for um, different setups, like I said, if you're using a, especially if you're different telescopes use different focusers like mine does, like I said, my, my eight inch uses an Optec focuser and my refractor uses a Senso. So they're totally different focusers. So my step sizes are different um, and all that fun stuff. Okay, um, what else? Uh, your, you know, your binning and all that kind of stuff. Temperature compensation. Um, <laughs> I'm up in the air about that. It depends on how accurate a focuser you have. Um, you can you can actually program this to say, hey, yeah, as the night goes on and as long as it has a temperature probe, have the focuser be creeping slowly with the temperature so you're not auto-focusing all the time. Um, it can work. I guess you got to experiment and see what works because obviously if you're not auto-focusing, you're collecting data. So that's more, you're being more uh, efficient with your time, especially if you're in Michigan or Ohio, the greater you know, the big cloud zones, um, you can be collecting a lot more data if you're not spending time auto-focusing. Um, anyway, so your telescope, um, you pick in here, same thing, pick your ASCOM driver. Um, obviously, if you're using the same mount, it's gonna be the same. Um, you can define things like, hey, when the sequence uh, stops or completes, what do you wanna do? I park my telescope, and, you know, put, for me, my park is actually, you define your park usually in your mount in the ASCOM, but, and I do, I park it to the north. Um, probably won't go into it a ton because I, I didn't know if people have observatories. I have a dome, so when my mount, my, my dome actually, you know, points to the north too and shuts the shutter. Um, you can define your meridian flips, which are important. Um, you could also stop tracking. So wherever your telescope was when you're done, you can have it just stop right there. Um, I don't know how many people really have done that. I haven't, um, but using meridian flips. So you can set it up here. This is an important one. Auto center after meridian flip. That's pretty important. I think for most people, even with, even with my astrophysics mount, I still like doing that just in case. Um, so I, so you, what happens is it'll take the picture beforehand and then it'll do the flip and then they'll take another picture and say, oh, okay, yeah, it's, it's off a little bit. Let's recenter it back up so you're at least back on center for whatever you're doing. That's I think that's a really important one to have checked. Um, uh, you can set up some pauses before and after. How many minutes? I this is a really finicky one. The Meridian football. I know a lot of people have struggled with this sometimes, and sometimes it has to do with um, people who have mounts like astrophysics or even uh, paramounts who can track past the meridian um, and trying to get SGP to work with the the manufacturer with that mount, whether it's an astrophysics to flip at the proper time, you know. So in those cases, I would say the I, I don't have a ton of experience because I just I don't track I don't do imaging past the meridian that much. Um, I just when it gets there, I just flip and I just move on and just go, you know, I probably will someday. So maybe we'll have a part two for this someday. Um, anyway, uh, sync behavior. This is going to be very important to have because when you do plate solving, what you're going to do is it's going to plate solve and it's going to tell the mount too, saying, hey, these are the coordinates of, that I'm at too. Um, and you got to sync and it's going to be very specific to your mount. So for my... Um, my astrophysics and my previous SG Pro mount, and actually any Celestron mount I had, it was a sync behavior. And there's a few different options, whether it's target offset, scope offset, uh, 
none. I don't think you want none because then it wouldn't sync and it wouldn't be good because you'd plate solve and then you wouldn't you wouldn't sync to it and you'd still be lost. You know, so that's not good. Um, scope focal length. That's important. You want to put that in there again. It's another spot you can put it in, and you do want to put it in. Um, so for my um, actually, you don't put it in back here. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, this is the spot where you put the focal length of your scope in. It's used for plate solving. Um, right there. Aperture. You can put it in. I really don't know what it's used for, honestly. I haven't used it much. Um, if anyone does know, feel free to chime in. Uh, scope nudges. You don't really have to worry about too much of that with, um, with this. Uh, plate solving. Uh, okay, so I'll cover this in depth too. Basically, um, you're just gonna plate solving is pretty much gonna be about the same for most setups. The only way I can think it's gonna be different is um, if you're working with a really wide field setup, you might wanna adjust your settings on like your binning or your search patterns or possibly even the exposure times because it's possible to actually have too much stars because you can have problems with that. I've, I had it with my 61 millimeter where I've had to dial back my exposure time because I was getting a bazillion stars and this it was just a problem. So I found when I had shorter exposures, my plate saws were actually successful almost consistently where I, versus my default I always used with my F8 for whatever reason. Um, which filter to use, you know, just so that kind of stuff. Anyway, we'll cover that stuff later. Auto guiding, same thing here. What are you going to use? Um, like I said, there's uh, PHD2. Uh, Meta guide is probably the other boy. Astro art. I don't know anyone who uses Astro art, honestly. Direct mount guider. I don't know of anyone. Practice guider. That's just the practice. Sky guard, sky guide. That is, if you have an on axis guider, um, I used to have one. Those things are awesome. Um, I wish I had it. I'll probably buy another one now. Um, it's a really cool way to um, guide, basically, um, and actually auto keep focus all the time because it's it's the whole premise of an on axis guider is light comes in, it goes through a dichloric infrared bypass mirror. So the starlight comes in, hits the mirror. Only the the infrared light goes straight through the mirror and goes to your auto guider. And then you guide on there right on access. So you got your on access guider right there. And then the rest of the light above the infrared, you know, so you're not, it's not passing infrared up. So all your light goes up to your image or above it. And so that's also part of the theory is, is the um, scene is actually the issues with like, you know, bouncing around and stuff is, is reduced with infrared light. So um, that software package right there, SkyGuard uses that technology and also they use um, a focus thing um, optech they use it it's called um, uh, what's it called sharp I think it's called sharp focus um, it's continuous focusing every time the auto guider takes its exposure the um, it looks at the astigmatism of the guider itself the uh, the guide star. And as it detects changes in it, it actually adjusts the focus around the fly. So every guide frame is also autofocusing at the same time. I do miss that because I never had to autofocus ever again. I mean, it, it just, it works really well. So anyway, so that's what that is. So, but we're just gonna focus on PhD. Um, this is uh, pretty important stuff, obviously. Um, I do have a slide on, do I have it on guiding? Nope. Nope. Okay, so I do have it. We're gonna talk about it here. So for PhD2, um, oops, I don't have it here. Let me pull it up real quick. Close that. Get it pulled up. PhD2, um, most people here have used it, um, I'm assuming. Um, the good old trusty one. I'm using the dev one, which is the latest bleeding edge. They usually are pretty stable. Um, if you haven't used this or used it with this or any other package, probably the biggest thing you gotta do is go under tools and click enable server. That's probably the biggest thing you have to do with this. So, um, and that allows them basically to talk back and forth. And then same thing in here, you you will go in here and you have to define, um, you know, your, you go into your little brain. Oops. You go in here and you set up, you know, for your, your, um, 
you know, what your exposure times are, what the pixel size of your camera is, um, it's your guiding. Oh boy, there's just so much stuff you can do here. What's your focal length of your guide scope? I use an uh, off-axis guider. So this is the focal length of my refractor right now. So it's 275 millimeters, not much. But I, even with a tiny little refractor, I, I off-axis guide and I, and I have round stars. It's hard to not have good guiding with a, that focal length, but I still do it. Um, set up your calibration, um, your algorithms. I mean, there's a whole, we can, there's been some great talks um, online, there's um, the Astro Imaging Channel. They've had some um, guests on there just covering this. Um, there's a lot of YouTube videos on PhD2. There's a lot of good, this PhD2's website, there's some tutorials. You can go deep dive into here. But for, for our purposes here, we're just gonna cover how it pertains to auto guiding. Um, whoops, I picked there. Here we go. So, um, we got PhD2. Um, probably the biggest thing I, I would want to say is you want a dither. Dither is so good. It's, um, you're going to adjust each frame a little bit each time, or depends on how many you do it. Because obviously right here, you can set how many frames between each time you dither. I dither every frame. Um, my mounts actually moves real fast, really accurate. Sometimes some mounts are, have a problem where they, you know, it can take a little bit of time and you just don't want to waste the time. Or if you're doing super short exposures, you know, you don't want to say, you know, like I was telling Richard earlier, I was doing uh, 15 second exposures of, of the Orion core and I forgot I had it on every frame. So I did 15 seconds, dither, 15 seconds, dither. So I racked up a huge amount of time where I shouldn't have spent that much time. But anyway, the idea is, is you're shifting the picture around so that when you actually do your stacking, you're going to help eliminate, you know, uh, some of the, the patterns, the, the random noises from like cosmic ray hits and all this other stuff. So it's really good to dither. Dither is just so important. You should, if you're not dithering, then, oh boy, you're like, you're just leaving so much on the table. It's, you should just definitely dither. Um, so you always want to have a dithering. Um, it, how much you should do it? One to three frames, somewhere in there. Um, if you're if you're doing longer exposures, dither every frame. There's no reason. If you're like, boy, if you're especially if you're like going north, like since I have a CCD, my narrowband frames are like 20 minutes a piece. So I'm definitely dithering every frame. Um, if you're a CMOS where you can do some shorter ones, you could probably do every couple, every two, three frames. Um, you can get away with that because you're going to be stacking so many of them. You can you can handle that. You're not spending time you know moving around. So as far as how much you want to dither, you have small, medium, high. I mean, that extreme, that's really going to depend on um, your setup, you know, like what your image scale is and stuff and what's like the difference between your guider image scale and your, your, um, your imaging gimmicks image scale. So for instance, if you have a guide scope and you're imaging with a, you know, it depends on what it is. I mean, if you're, you know, 0.8 uh, arc seconds a pixel versus your guider that which is at like, uh, you know, three arc seconds, you know, a, a small dither might be, you know, three arc seconds and also you're moving a few pixels on your main scope. I mean, it really depends. So what I would recommend is kind of play around with it and figure out what's going to be best for yours. Um, you can't go really too big. I mean, I guess you could, but just play around with it. Uh, your settle time is after it dithers, your auto guider has to settle back down. And so, you know, it's going to want to get back onto the center, you know, of your centeroid of your guider. And you're telling it once it, you know, how close do you have to be for it to consider to be, you know, di you know dither success. And so I have it set up for one pixel. Once it gets within one pixels, I tell it to start the countdown clock of 10 seconds. And then once it gets down to zero, my exposure starts again. So does that make sense to hopefully everyone? Um, anyway, yeah, so you could have it for, like I said, it's gonna depend on your mount. Um, if some mounts have backlash, sometimes some mounts really do need some time to settle in. Um, it's gonna vary. That's from my old settings. I, I'm Like I said, I'm, I, I just got an astrophysics mount. So I know they're super accurate. I'm still used to Celestron mounts, which are, I had a few quirks and so I haven't really fine tuned my new setup with my parameters, but 
one pixel and 10 seconds seemed to work. It didn't seem like I was wasting a whole lot of time and I didn't have any issues and I get round, round stars. So um, the other stuff, uh, pause directives. When do you want the guider to be paused? I pause during autofocus because when you autofocus, when you're auto, when you're, if you try guiding when you're autofocusing, you get all sorts of craziness. Your graph gets going like this and yeah, you don't want to do that. So I just pause. It's not worth it. Um, you can pause during image downloads, during backless compensation. There's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, your stops. I stop my auto guider when I'm done with the sequence. So I just say, hey, just be done auto guiding. That's just fine. Some people you can keep guiding if you want. I mean, that's totally up to you. It doesn't make sense that once I'm done for the night from an image automated imaging, there's no reason to keep guiding. Um, other directives, restart the frame. This is a super important one, I think, for automated when you're like asleep type of thing. Restart the frame when the guider distance is greater than so many pixels. So when you're auto guiding, you know, like I said, we have the tools and you have this thing. So it's talking to PhD2. I'm telling it that if it detects in PhD2 that the guide star has gone past three and a half pixels, restart my imaging frame because something went wrong, whether I'm dragging a cable, the wind came in, a bird smacked into the side, who knows, you know, all sorts of craziness happens for some reason. And I can guarantee that when I hit the three and a half pixel range, I'm gonna have an, uh, 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 the, the pic my star shapes are not gonna be good. I, I, it'll be an automatic rejection. I might as well just toss the frame right then and there. So I might as well automatically do that. So once again, that's something you got to determine for your setup. Maybe you have a tighter tolerance because you're trying to do really high resolution work. Maybe you have a, you know, maybe you're doing really wide field stuff and you can go bigger than three and a half pixels. I could probably go bigger than three and a half pixels with at 275 millimeters. That's just a holdover from my um, other scope. But I found that's worked really well <clears throat> where Hey, you know, and, and you can see there's event logs that you can see, hey, you know, something happened where there was wind, you know, you're all set. Okay, so let's keep moving here. Uh, switches, this is in 4.0. I, I don't really use it. I, I probably sh will eventually. You have the ability to like automatically, I mean, you have some of the new like uh, Pegasus uh, power boxes, like the integrated USB and power boxes where you can, you know, jack in your cameras, your do heaters, your this and that. There is a, um, um, oh, here's a, the Prima Loose Eagle. There's all sorts of stuff. I have a, um, I have a internet switch that's um, a, a, a power strip that's ethernet capable. That does work with this. There's an ASCOM, another ASCOM thing that I can say, hey, you know, I can control and say, hey, at the end of the night, turn off my mount, turn off the power box on top of the thing, you know, shut power off. You can program that kind of stuff. Good thing for automation that, hey, you know, at the end of the night, shut things down. I don't really do that because I, I just haven't got to that level yet. Um, but I usually in the morning just want to make sure everything is closed up and I just do it manually. But that is available here with these switches. Switches are new in 4.0. You won't see them in any of the three releases that came out in 4. Um, so, and then finally, in other, um, you have uh, flat boxes for automation. Um, if you have like a, um, the Optech, uh, Optech, uh, panels, um, I'm trying to think here, there's the Pegasus. There's a few of them that can be automated where if you have, have them hanging on the wall, maybe at the end of the night or even on a cloudy night, you can have the scope, you know, slew to a park position or some preset position through a script and point to it, take your flat frame for the night and then be done. You know, it'll automatically turn on and off. Remember where I said in your, in your filters area where you can tell the box to go to X brightness on the filter on the on the flat frame box device. This is this is where you and actually you can do it right here. Here's this little deal right here. And he brings it up and you can go, hey, for my red frame, I want the the brightness to be this. Um, really handy. Uh, rotator. If you have an automatic rotator, Optech makes one. Um, uh, Moonlight has one. Uh, Pegasus has one. Uh, 
plane wave has one. You could do rotator stuff. Um, obviously you can set it up. I don't have a rotators, hopefully someday. Uh, your observatory, if you have a dome or um, a roll off roof, um, I have a dome, so I have slave settings. So for me, I wanna make sure I'm at home before the shutter closes. That's really important for an automation point of view because when it closes actually, that's where my charger is. So <laughs> if I'm down actually, then it just doesn't work out. I, it won't charge up for the night because my the shutter actually has a battery that moves with the shutter. So if I just closed it at random slots, I'd have a dead battery pretty quick. Um, so, and you have other slave settings here where you define, you know, um, you can go obviously here, you can pick your roll off roof or your dome. You can set up your parameters, which is very uh, much like the ASCOM uh, dome setup. Um, you know, park the, the observatory with the mount, do all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, slave, you know, you know, your slave settings. And then finally, there's the safety monitor. Um, I have the sky alert, which I haven't, I don't know why it's not set up here. Sky alert is like the bolt wood. It monitor, you know, it, it, it'll look at the sky um, and, and check for clouds, basically. Um, it looks at the temperature difference. So on um, a cloudy night, the sky is going to be maybe, let's say this time of year for me, it's about, actually, we can pull it up. I got it right here. Um, Right now, the, sky, uh, the ambient temperature is 38 degree. My sky temperature is 31.3. It's cloudy, and actually I can tell. Because when it's in the blue, last night it was clear. So you can see my blue line is down low, and it was clear last night, I can guarantee you. But now it's looking at the infrared. And when there's no clouds, you're looking out into space. So that's how it detects that there's clouds or not clouds. Well, you can tie this in with the software and say, hey, it's unsafe. When it's saying unsafe, you know, hey, there's you know, clouds was not a safe time. There's also a rain sensor on there and Boltwood has a rain sensor and there's a few other product lines out there or manufacturers. Um, so if it detects a rain thing, it says, hey, it's, you go from safe to unsafe. And when it goes to unsafe, you can tell with sequence generator pros, hey, unsafe, not good time, close up the roof, send out an alert. There's an alert uh, phone system. You can get an email, you can get a text. I get a text on my phone. My wife can attest to that at two o'clock in the morning that Texas do come. Um, so anyway, so yeah, so your safety, you can configure that stuff here that, you know, just go in there and tell where the alert is and all that fun stuff. Uh, the environmental thing, if for some reason you wanna actually um, get like information from from your um, sky alert or bolt wood and actually have it go into your environmental tab and maybe put some of the properties into your file, <clears throat> you can do that. Oh yeah, and that's one last thing. Your file naming pattern, this is so much stuff in SG Pro to, to really do. Your file naming uh, area, this is gonna determine what your, what your um, file name is. How do you automatically you know, do your file names. You know, here's here's the key for how it builds up your file name automatically. You'll put in basic information like what's your sequence name, the Horsehead Nebula. Well, what's the other stuff you want to put in there? Well, what frame number this is, what the temperature was, what's the ISO, maybe the binning um, frame type. You can put a bazillion different things in there, and and, and that's what this does. And I'll show you here in a second. Um, any questions on the equipment manager? And like I said, um, whoops, wrong one. You can make multiple ones and you can set them for defaults. So I pick here and then I, um, uh, yeah, you use the checkbox. Hey, just make this one a default set. So when you create a new sequence, a new game plan for your imaging night, it uses whatever the default is, unless you tell it to say, oh yeah, by the way, I'm gonna use the non-default one. Any questions? Anyone? A lot of stuff. Okay, let's move on. Okay, next one. I'm going to switch back to you share PowerPoint. I will make this uh, PowerPoint available. I, Richard, I don't know how we can make the PowerPoint diff available afterwards or someone. Um, I'll have my email at the very end if you want to email me for this PowerPoint or reach out to me with questions, feel free. Um, whoops, uh, I'll just do it this way. So plate solving. Um, yeah, so that's what we're gonna cover next year. Actually, I got the little 
what's what it shows on here. So for plate solving, um, it is, I'm just gonna pull a picture up here because I can do a demonstration for it. Um, whoops. Okay. okay, so plate solving, you pick your, uh, your, um, your, well, I apologize, I'm just trying to, your plate solving interface. Um, ASTAP is probably the recommended one now, especially if you're on version four. If you're not on version four, you're not going to be able to have this one available. Um, you're going to have plate solve two, which is actually pretty good. Um, uh, ASTAP tends to be very, quite a bit faster. It handles some edge cases like um, globular, you know, when you do, it seems like with, with um, plate solve two, there were instances where, um, you know, like globular clusters or maybe um, galaxies, you get some erroneous readings. Um, it was a lot of development, a lot of testing. Um, I know on the um, sequence generator pro board, there was a lot of really good good talk with the developer of the ASTAP um, actual module. They actually use that. They you know ship off the data, the 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 plate solving frame to the software package. You basically when you install it, um, you you put it in there. Um, it has instructions on how to install it, install that and then put it in make it use usable for for this software but anyway it makes it real fast solve i mean before there'd be times where you would be just sitting there kind of waiting for it to solve where now it's like it can be very quick but again you got to have the information in there you got to actually have a few things you got to have a focused frame so obviously the auto focuser comes in handy so you got to be pretty focused but you also got to give it the information you know what's the plate scale and what is be fairly close. You want to be in the ballpark. Um, and then what's your focal length? So, you know, and obviously the focal length is going to help, you know, if you already have the plate scale, that's really the biggest thing it needs. Um, but, and, and obviously the pixel size, you know, it's going to know that it's going to get that information, but, and that's going to help speed up the calculations and actually get you a correct uh, solve. You know, otherwise, if you give it wrong information, it's going to sit there really not knowing anything. Um, and, Plus, if your telescope is not, if you're like, if it's like totally lost to start with, if you're pointing in the east and you like tell it it's pointing in the west, it's not, it's going to have a hard time plate solving. So you kind of got to at least be starting off in a, in a close ballpark. But anyway, so in general, I you, you want to use like two by two or three by three. They even have a four by four option for bending when you do this. You're not looking for sharpness. You're just looking for really fast. You want to get stars. Um, you know, you want to knock down the noise too. So if you bend it, you can get there really quick. Um, do, a, do a fairly long exposure. I mean, for, for what we're doing here, five, 15 seconds. Um, you want to... Um, um, you know, just get as many stars as possible. Um, and obviously, like I said, with, with my with my short refractor or wide field setup, I don't need a super long exposure because I get a ton of stars right off the bat just because I'm looking at such a large area. But with my, with my um, you know, when I start getting into like over, you know, when I get, well, my eight inch ref, uh, Ritchie is, you know, 1600 uh, millimeter focal length and pointing over toward the spring galaxies, there's not a lot of stars sometimes. So I'll, I go on the longer side, or I, I'll t typically have my exposures more toward the 15 second range. Um, but I, I typically don't have problems with plate solving. Um, if you see here on the side here, I'm just gonna hopefully you're not seeing that. Um, so anyway, so you, so you got your bending, your search region, just leave that at max re regions, that's fine. You can set your exposure time. Your scope centering, how many temps do you want it to, um, um, this goes part is um, when you're doing automatic centering as far as like, I'll show you when we do our sequence parts where you have it automatically like um, move on to different objects or when you do meridian flips and stuff. How many times is it going to actually give this whole thing a try? Um, five times, three times, how many times do you want it to do it before it says up, I give up and it goes into recovery mode. Um, and, and, and what's your tolerance, you know? How many pixels? I, I give it a, a definition of 50 pixels for me. I think that's for my refractor, you know, when I'm 
looking at humongous degrees, 50 pixels is plenty for me. Um, and if you have a rotator, you can def define it there. Um, also importantly, what filter do you want to use? Um, when you're plate solving, don't even mess with going through color filters and narrow band to switch over to your luminance or a clear filter or no filter at all if you want, as long as it's in full, actually stick with your filters. Because if you go to a clear, and it's, you know, you're probably not going to be in focus because there's no parafocalness, but go to your, go to your uh, clear or luminance filter and just shoot through there because you're going to get the most light through. Um, and then, you know, it's going to work good. Um, I'm just trying to think here. Yeah, let me, let's want to get, I'm going to pull a picture up real quick here. Um, Does anyone have a question on that? I'm gonna switch over to, okay. So this is from the other night. This is the uh, California Nebula in um, H alpha. It's a 20 minute exposure. I got, luckily I got a satellite as usual. Actually two satellites, looks like it. So uh, plate solving, I'll we'll do a quick demo here. Um, normally it would um, do it whether you're, um, you're doing a meridian flip or automatically you know, going to the object at the beginning of the night or maybe you know, it's the second object in your list for the night or you can actually do a plate solve. And I, that's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do a plate solve. Um, and I'm just gonna click solve. You can give it a name and do all this other stuff, give it a scale. My scale is four, <laughs> four, I got four arc seconds, 4.1, I mean, it's huge. So and it's solving, it's thinking, and now it's done. And that's how long, I mean, before with like, um, before it would you know take a, quite a bit of time and it gives me a confidence of 999. Why they came up with 999, don't ask me, I, I have no idea. Um, and it tells you what your scale is, um, what angle the frame is at. So I was pretty good at getting this camera back on. I eyeballed it. So I got actually pretty on pretty square, right ascension. Um, nice option here is this is really good. This is what I typically do once I, when, when I'm first getting ready, like, hey, you know, I'm going to start a new, this is my first picture for the night for this object. I think I got it framed up pretty well. Um, I want, okay, yeah, I like this, and this is the framing I want. What you can do then is you can check this box and say, use this plate solve coordinates and then pick your object and say, yeah, you know what? This is gonna be my coordinates that I just plate solve because this is how this is what I want to return to every single time I do this now. Um, and then you hit okay and it takes the coordinates, the right ascension and declination and the angle if you have a rotator. If it doesn't have a rotator, it'll put the angle in there, but if you don't have a rotator, that's fine. It won't do anything, it won't blow up. So, but that's what the plate solving does. It just, it does it fairly quickly. Um, one option there is you saw there's use the blind paint, blind solve. If for some reason the ASTAP or any of the other ones that you, if you pick, there's pinpoint, if you have the old pinpoint from back in, way back in the like the old days, um, it's still out there, it still works. Um, you can use a blind plate solve, which would go out um, on the internet. And um, uh, I think we can actually define it. Hold on one second here. Uh, nope, that's not that. Well, oh yeah, plate solve. So what, what you can go in there and say, what do you want to use for your plate solve? For me, I'm using the uh, you know, astrometria.net. Um, well, that's the only option. Well, actually you can use this. You can do it. There's a, well, that's really, I haven't used that in a while. You can do, actually install another local plate solver on your local machine, which would be good if you're doing like remote, going out in the middle of the desert and you don't have internet, you want to have like a secondary one that's local to your hard drive. Um, the the ASTAP is, all contained on there because you do download a, a a large star database to your computer. It's like a few few many gigs, um, which is good. But anyway, um, this is a failover. So if for some reason the main one doesn't work, 
it'll fail over and it does take some time. You might as well go get a cup of coffee sometimes, but it does work. Um, plate solving is super important because that's going to get you going around. It's going to know where you are. It's going to sync you up. Your mount will know where it's going. And honestly, I mean, there's a lot of things about, hey, you know, get your, and once you have good polar alignment and you've you got to create this model, if you're, if you're doing automated imaging and you're going to be using plate solving, I, if you're on a mobile setup, I guess I would argue to not even deal with the modeling too much because you will plate solve, it'll center itself and you'll be going. I mean, I guess you could create a big model. I did create a model for my astrophysics just because I wanted just to, to say I'd done it and it does make it accurate. I don't, I do my plate solves and there's nothing to do when <laughs> I mean, it's centered. So anyway, um, let me go back over to the slideshow here. Trying to see what time, nine o'clock. How am I doing around time, Richard? You're fine. Okay, cool. Next up, autofocusing. Boy, this is a, this one gets, can trip up people. Um, autofocusing. <sighs> um, boy, where, where to start on this guy? Autofocusing. I'm gonna switch over so I can have a, One second here. So, um, like I said, for 4.0, uh, the new, um, the new, this is a new metric because you, you use the ASTAP for, um, for, that's a new option for, for finding, for helping with the focusing. It's not available in the version three. Um, it does, I think, help produce a more solid. There's actually a few things. Actually, there's a, in version three, it used, I believe, just a polynomial fit. It would just create the little V curve for you and it, and it would just do like a best fit. Um, nothing super elaborate. Um, and there was, eh, it, depending on the setup, people set up, I mean, it's really it varies setup dependent. Some people had problems, some people didn't have problems. Um, this new, this one does work. I think it's very fast and it's very robust. First of all, it can actually, you know, it can plate, basically it does the same thing as plate solving. It, you know, it goes in and measures the, the, the HFD real quickly. So for autofocusing, you want to autofocus fast because you're going to be taking multiple, you're going to take a picture you know, go out of focus, take a picture, you know, move the focus, take another picture and move the focus. So you want to get through it as fast as possible. So when you're measuring the whole, you know, the stars in the frame, um, one thing to point out is um, this in SGP, it, it does take all the stars that it can detect and use that for its focusing. So it's a, it's a full frame focusing algorithm. Um, when you look at back in, um, you know, even five, six years ago when you're, the previous gold standard was um, Focus Max and that would use a single star, um, which, and it was really good and it still is a, a pretty solid thing, but you're depending on one star and you couldn't go too bright of a star, um, but it was still a good, very good. Here you could use the entire frame, which can be, I think, a little better because you're you can kind of weight it across. It, granted, if you have like some significant curvature, maybe their sweet spot's really small in the center. Well, obviously you maybe should get some corrective optics or, you know, a reducer or a corrector to fix that. But still you want to have um, a good focus metric. And so, so for version four here, this is the one you want to use. Um, the other option would be half flux radius. Um, you could use it. I mean, you could try it out. I mean, see what works. But most people, I think, use this now. Um, correct me if anyone is wrong. The other option is to use the full width half maximum via pinpoint. You got to have the full license pinpoint to do that. I don't know anyone that's using that, honestly. So, oops. Hey, look at that. I just accidentally clicked that on my session. So anyway, that's the first thing is what metric you're using. Now, step size. Step size, I think, is um, the really um, important spot that we need to figure out here is, like I said, depending on your focuser, 
you know, how much should you move your focuser? Because really, when you start this up, ideally, you should be ballpark close to focus to begin with. Um, and, you know, you, you can't be like crazy out of focus because this just won't work. I mean, it, it just won't magically work. Even focus max won't work. If you started off with a big donut in the middle and you said, focus max, go focus this, it ain't going to work. Um, so you got to be fairly close to focus with this. And so with step sizes, you got to be able to tell it. I mean, are you going to do one step? Is that going to be enough to make that, to be able to see any difference? 10 steps, you know, 100 steps, 200 steps, 1,000 steps. That's dependent on your focuser. And what you want to do is you, we want to build up a, um, you know, good data points. And you don't want to spend too much time doing it, but you need to have a, a good um, V curve. So I probably between five and nine, I think is a good range to be in. Um, I use seven. Um, and for me, and actually you can see on my, my, my example down here, I have a um, uh, 500. Now this is for my refractor, my Senso. So it has a, um, the focus, uh, the stepper range is quite a bit bigger than on my um, Optec, um, uh, my TCFS focuser. Um, that I only use like a step size of like, I think a hundred on that one. This is 500. So what happens is, is I use seven, seven um, focus points. Um, what I'm gonna do here, I'll show you here in a minute what, what it'll look like. Um, so what it does is it, it takes basically three on each side. And in theory, if, if you started off in perfect focus, you'd have the very middle data points gonna be your perfect focus. And then on the th three on one side and three on the other side, they all should go out and do a, you know, a perfect little V or a little curve. Obviously a V would be ideal, but you're gonna have three on each side. So it's going to say, okay, with 500, it's going to go five times three. So it's going to go 1,500 steps out. So the focuser, when you start it, it's going to go 1,500 backwards. You know, it'll go out, outward, 1,500, and then take a picture. Move in 500, take a picture, move in 500. And each time, it should be moving down, moving down, moving down. And at the third one, um, for in this example with seven, actually the fourth one, it should be at the very bottom. And then the fifth one, it should be move up, then move up and then move up. And it's very important that you're moving through what's called the critical focus zone because there's that spot where um, your focus, if you're obviously the focusers nowadays, the focus motors, you can do like a one, a one say one step. Let's say your critical focus zone is a hundred steps wide. You know, you can move, anywhere in that hundred steps and you won't see any change in your focus, it'll be perfect. And if you say, do, you, 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 you know, if you find your perfect focus with do whatever other method and you do your seven, you, you start with seven data points and you, even if you do 10 and you back up three, you're, you never even moved it out of the focus zone. So you're never even gonna be able to create, you're gonna get this little mushy, wavy thing. So you got to be able to move this thing far enough out, but you can't go too far out because if you go too far out, say with even with like a Newtonian or a Schmidt-Castor grain, you're going to get this humongous donut for across your field and you won't be able to find them actually. So like I said, it takes some, you got to know a few things about your, your, like your, you know, like your focuser, you know, what's your step range for your focuser. Um, and probably the best way to do it is like get for perfect focus. Um, there's a few, you can get some of the mask and stuff, you know, get your, you get your focus that way. And then just back it off. Sorry, if maybe set your step size to hundred and just back it off, back it off a few times and, and see how, how it works. Or even, it might even takes a few, uh, spend a little bit of time figuring out, you know, do seven and, you know, set it for a hundred or 200 and, and let it do its thing. And then see how it looks. And you just want to get it to develop. Now, you're going to have some slight differences if you have really poor seeing and very good seeing. You might get it might be a little. It's definitely going to be a little sloppier on poor seeing versus good seeing. Um, but like I said, you, we really do want to have make sure you're having enough, a big enough step size that you're you know that the you know the, the stars are growing because that's what we want. You want to start go from your focus to a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. So you're going to start off big and then move, 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 and then move, 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 move. 
So that's how it's going to look. I'll show you a picture here in a minute. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Um, like I said, it's really dependent on your on your um, your step size of your particular focuser. Because, like I said, I, some focusers have their ranges are all over the place on some of them. It's hard to tell. Um, next thing, autofocus with a filter. Um, most filters nowadays are parafocal. Um, you can test it. What you do is spend a, a moon fill night, full moon night, go over to a star, run your autofocuser. Once you have the autofocuser, hey, I got it. I can I can do consistent, get V curves, and do all that fun stuff. Okay, run run it through all your filters and run it maybe three times for each filter or five times and and record it into a spreadsheet. Um, there's actually there's a, there's a couple of tools out there I think that helps automate this, but do that and figure out what the what the actual focus perfect focus point is for each filter and and see if they truly are parafocal for your setup. Um, and it's probably going to be different if you're a refractor because each each wavelength is probably going to focus slightly differently. Um, but that's going to be good to know because if you want to use like um, down here, there's the option autofocus with filter. You could say, yeah, you know, obviously if you're doing auto focusing, um, you know, more stars, the better you can get bigger. You know, like I said, the more data samples because it's using the entire frame. Um, you can say, hey, use my luminance filter, especially if you're using narrow band, hey, use luminance filter and then go back to my narrow band filter. Hey, all is great. And then you can use those filter offsets. If you know, for instance, that the difference in perfect focus between my luminance and my my H alpha or my O3 or S2, I'll say my S2 is because S2s are really bad to try to focus through, is a hundred steps. Then hey, focus with the yellow filter with the with the uh, luminance filter, it comes to five thousand. Well, then that means I got to put my S2 at 5,100, and then, then it's in perfect focus, and the software will do that automatically for you. Really handy to have, and that's all automated at that point. You spent like, you know, one evening, you know, figuring out the perfect focus for all your filters. Make sure you do it through a few times so you get a good average for them. Um, otherwise, um, if you have it unchecked, when it runs the autofocuser, it's whatever filter is currently in use. So if your red filter is there, it's gonna focus through your red filter. Um, and it's going to use the um, the whatever numbers in your filter configuration. If you remember back there on our filter page, there was a little spot for what exposure to use for autofocus. Whatever number is there is what it's going to use for autofocusing through that colored filter. So if you haven't filled it out, you're going to be wondering like, why am I why am I doing a one second autofocus exposure for my H alpha filter? And there's nothing here. It's all a bunch of noise. Well, that's why you got to go back in there for your setup and change it to 60 seconds or 30 seconds, whatever you need. Um, Autofocus or frequency. Hey, that's a, that, that's going to be um, really nice to have for, you know, your automation is, you know, you want to stay in focus because as the night goes on, you're going to typically start off and it's going to be 70 degrees in the summer and it's going to drift down to say 50 degrees or whatever. Your, your tube's going to shrink your optic shrink, you know, whatever, you know, you're going to get out of focus. And sometimes it's rapid. I mean, I've, I've, you know, auto focused at the beginning of the night, got my auto guider going, got the calibration for the auto guider, moved over to the target or got some other things. One got a cup of coffee and got back and I've already dropped one degree. And it's like, oh, and I know at one degree, I, I, I'm out of focus already. So you can set up this for, um, hey, the software will automatically Autofocus, hey, every X amount of frames. If you are insistent that, hey, I know every five frames I want this autofocused, okay, you can do it. This many degrees of change. Now, to do it off of degrees, your autofocuser does have to have a temperature probe. A lot of them have the option of at least being optional. Um, you can just plug in and it has the little silver end, um, and it'll give you the ability to say, hey, you know, after one degree, two degree, five degree, half a degree, whatever you want, it'll autofocus. Like I said, just look at what your, your particular setup is. I set it for every one degree. I found that after one degree, it, I just feel better. And, and I've proven it too, that after one degree, I do have issues. Um, and I also, 
um, autofocus every 60 minutes, one hour. Even if my temperature is totally stable, I'm, I'm sure the pictures are fine, but I just feel better knowing, hey, at least once an hour I autofocused. I mean, I got my system fast enough autofocusing where it only takes like three minutes to autofocus. And I mean, I'm sure I'm gonna waste maybe, actually over seven hours, you know, that's uh, that's like 20 minutes. So it does add up. Um, but still every hour I, I every hour I do autofocus if I haven't even had a temperature change. Usually in the early night I am autofocusing, but as I get later in the night, I have it autofocus every hour. Um, I have it autofocus on filter changes just because I know there's differences in my filters because I have a little mix match. I have the astronomic uh, type two C's and I also have the astronomic uh, deep sky filters in there. So I have a slight difference between them. Even though they should be pair focus because their thicknesses are the same, I know they're, they're a little bit different. And I, I myself haven't spent a full moon night remeasuring all the their offsets yet. Um, before the sequence starts, um, yeah, you could do that. Assuming that you are, I guess it depends on where you start. <laughs> um, you know, if you're pointing at the object and you hit start, then yeah, it'll autofocus and then start doing its thing. If, if you're like automated, you know, like you're in a dome and stuff and you hit start, you know, you would technically be, maybe you have to wait for the shutter open or maybe you're pointing into some trees or there might be some situations where you might not want that. Um, I myself, I'm usually at the helm at my computer to get it, to get the whole thing going. Um, and so I don't really need that. Um, autofocus and resume. Um, I do have that check now so that when, if the thing does start going again, after say some clouds come through, I have it refocus automatically. Um, and then after automatic centering actions, which is meridian flips, um, if I move off to another object, because typically it, I'm moving across the sky a lot of times, it'll be, I get my, um, my last pictures are way off in the west, and then I'm heading over to the east or down into this, you know, I'm moving across the sky quite a bit, so it's good to have a refocus, um, and it doesn't hurt. Um, I think that's actually, I want to switch over to show you one thing with the, I got to find this. Okay. Okay. There is um, something called SGP Log Viewer. If you want to Google that, it's a real handy utility. You can go in there and look at your log files, your error, temperature, guides to all sorts of stuff. And one thing is, is your autofocusers. You can see all the autofocuser runs. So for my, um, uh, I'm trying to think which run this was. The other night, you can see this is my autofocus. You can see my V-shape. This is every single one I done through the night. And you can see as the temperature changed, my focus position changed throughout the night. So my tube was shrinking, you know. But this is what you want. You want to have a nice V-shape. There's a little bit of a kink. It always happens on that side. That's fine. Um, and this is the the 500 steps. You know, I kind of built up and it is, it's very repeatable. Um, and this is with a, um, a sharp star refractor and it's just a standard built-in um, focuser. It's a rack and I believe it's a rack and pinion and it has the Senso uh, focuser uh, or auto focuser motor on there. So it's not a really super high end one but it can give them really good results. I got a fairly heavy camera on. I got a CCD on the filter wheel, off axis guider, a load star on there. So it's holding it pretty well, but this is what you should be getting if you have a, your, your data points and your step size right. Um, you get a nice solid, um, a nice V curve. This is what you should be getting. Um, and, and this is very typical for my eight inch scope too, my eight inch Richie, even with the, you know, the, the, the large secondary. So, um, like I said, uh, SGP log viewer, very handy because this actually does show like the entire night. This will show the whole plan of what happened the whole night. So down here at the bottom, telescope slews, recoveries, integration, plate solves. It shows graphically what's going on the whole night. It's a good way to review what happened. See, I was taking a lot of, huh, you, I wonder where I did all my 15 second exposures for, um, you know, Orion, my 30 second and my 15 second are all piled up in here and all my little dithers, all the little, that was crazy. Anyway, 
So um, next up, any questions about auto focusing? I know that's a, usually one that trips people up. Um, one thing that you can do is uh, save. I know there's an option for um, saving the uh, autofocus packages. Um, that can be handy just to have check. It doesn't take up much disk space. So as you autofocus, it takes a snapshot of each, like the, the actual autofocus frame and the actual, you know, like the this information about what's going on during the autofocus, like the, your, your V curve, where it is at the moment, and it saves it into a directory. So that's handy to have. And then there's an option for dark subtraction. I've never really used that a whole lot. I've tried it and I haven't, I've had mixed results. I don't think it's really improved my autofocusing a whole lot. I guess if you have a super noisy camera, maybe uncooled, maybe it would work better with uh, DSLRs. Hey, Pete. Yeah. Uh, your focus, your time on your autofocuser. Yeah. How are them like 14 seconds or 15 seconds exposures when it's working in autofocus doing its thing? Yeah. Yeah, for um, for my autofocuser, for um, like for instance, the one I had up there, those were all H alpha, and those were. Uh, hold on one second. I will pull up. Does, would the more stars be the better for calculating focus? Yeah, absolutely. Exposure. I just here. I'll share my screen here. Quick second. So for the, for actually for my Orion Nebula, that's what that one graph was. But here's my H alpha. I'm using 20 second exposures for my autofocuser. All my uh, exposures for my broadband are 10 seconds and all my um, H alpha, my O3 and my S2 are 20 seconds long. Okay. But I use 20 seconds. I mean, it's, it just, I, I get enough stars and this is with my refract my 60 millimeter refractor so like for your for your takahashi 20 seconds i mean that's i i i can't see any downsides to it i mean obviously i mean it's i'm you're at gonna 14 spend, seconds right now you're at 14 yeah yeah well like i said it depends on your if you're having um you if you're having mixed results with your your focusing results, you probably want to take a look at like your step sizes. If you don't get really consistent um, uh, V graphs like this all the time, then um, you want to look at making sure that the step size is right for okay. yours. It depends on what motor you have attached to the focuser. That'd probably be the biggest thing. Um, yeah, mine's more of a curve. I don't get sharp points. Mine got like a bell curve. Okay. As long as it's consistent bell curves. But yeah, go, go try to up your uh, exposure time, especially if you're doing a lot of narrow band stuff. Don't even be afraid to go 30 seconds because you're not okay. doing really long because it means narrow band. You're not going to get a whole lot of stuff, especially if you're talking like if you're going to be auto focusing through an S2 filter, that's already a tough filter as it is. And there's not a lot out there. Um, that's where I said, you know, if you, if you can spend the night where you take your S2 filter and, and, and try to do a focus run just to try to figure out where your best focus is. Even if you do a one minute exposure to get really solid numbers and know that, hey, my S2 filter is at 5,000 and my luminance filter is at 5,100 and there's a hundred point difference, then you could always use your luminance filter to do the focusing and not mess around with the loop because the S2 could be, you know. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so, so, but yeah, try a 20 or 30 second exposure with uh, with a narrow band. Um, it's going to take a slightly longer time, but if you're, um, how many are you taking? Like five or seven or nine or? Uh, four, yeah, at least eight, I think, or nine, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't go much past nine. I mean, that's getting too much, I think. Um, I use seven and I, I've settled on seven after a long time. Um, okay. But I wouldn't go beyond eight or nine for sure. Uh, seven seems to be a nice middle number for me. Um, but definitely don't be afraid to go 20, 30 seconds because yeah, you want as many stars as possible. Yeah. The other thing that you can do, I didn't really point out in here, is in here, um,
There's a checkbox here called uh, crop autofocuser frames, autofocus frames. So like I said, it uses the entire frame. If you have a camera where there's some distortion on the outer edges, you always know it's gonna have distortion for some reason. I know you have the Takahashi and you have the corrector on there, so it's probably pretty solid. But maybe some people with, with, with uh, Schmidt Cassegrains or whatever, they have Newtonians, maybe some weirdness on there. You can actually have it only look at say, chop off like 5%. So it's only looking at like, it's not, it's not looking at the very edges. So, and that's what I do. I have it not even look at the 5%. I just chop off the very edges of it. So it's not dealing with that. So anyway, um, cool. so that's, that's a good, good tip there. Okay, next thing here. Okay, your sequence. This is um, your, your game plan here for, for what, you are, what are you gonna image? Um, Obviously, you know, you can really do this in point and shoot mode, um, but that's not automated. And we're talking automation here. We, we want to, you know, be able to do other stuff or just kind of like try to repeat it each night, night after night and collect more data. So in the top left corner here, you have what I guess you call is your targets. Um, really, you know, for me, I have calibration. There's M45. I got the California Nebula. I got my M42 and I got the squid. That's a really hard one, let me tell you that. Um, so in each one, with this sequence uh, window, and I'll show you it when I switch over back over to my sequence plan, everything works from top to bottom. So um, as you can see, I have check marks, check boxes there. So for this, if I started this whole thing new, it would start with the California Nebula first. And then when it finishes doing whatever I tell it to do there, it's going to go down to the M42. It won't go any other way. It won't go M42 and then move up to the California Nebula. It starts from the top and goes to the bottom. So like my calibration frames at the very top, that's where I, I always have a sequence plan for my calibration. I put all my dark frames, my flats, my all that kind of stuff. I put them in there. And so if I ever need to take them, I just go there. And, and so when it writes it off to a, a directory and at night, I, I, I can say, oh, there's my calibration. So anyway top to bottom on that side. And even down in the um, the, se uh, um, the sequence actually thing in the, the main middle area, top to bottom, it's gonna start at the very top one. If it's checkbox for run there, you see the run in there, um, whatever's checkbox is, it comes, it looks on the list and say, oh, where's the first checkbox? Up, oh, that's it. I'm running that one. And I'm gonna, when that's done, I'm gonna go to the next checkbox, top to bottom. So that's how you read those. So. In the very top one, you can see here, um, it's called target settings. It's the little, this, uh, hey, I can move these things around. It's right here. So like for M42 wide, you, this is where you go in there and you name it. So when you put the name in there, that's what it's gonna use for your like file names. You can use, obviously remember I told you, you can use that little decoder thing to have things get named automatically. It would pull from this, you know, so if you want your files, your directory, all that fun stuff. Um, uh, target settings. So yeah, so you can, um, when you actually hover over this, sorry, I'm gonna back up a second. This little box up here, um, when you hover over here, just on the far right edge of it, a little uh, gear will appear and you just click that and then this target setting box opens up. So you can put your name in here or the name of whatever it is, you can call it whatever you want. You can put the coordinates in, you can type them in yourself. You can use the sky or whatever, use star atlas, whatever you want, you can type it in. Um, what I found is really handy is you can go on Astro Bin or Telescopus or Flickr and actually get the URL. So if you're on Astro Bin and say, oh, that's a really cool picture. I like the framing or that's just a cool picture and I want it to be like centered that way. Grab that URL, click that blue thing, pop it in there and hit, um, get coordinates, I believe that's what it's called. And it'll actually get the coordinates from there and populate it for you. And I that is the so super handy to have um, do that for you. Cause I'm in Astro Bin a lot and I'm always looking for, you know, framing ideas or like, hey, you know, what's a, cause like I said, you know, this is, um, you know, in the image automation, there's really no like, you know, you don't do, it's not like a star, uh, a planetarium program where you can just pick on something and just, 
click and go to it. You got to put the coordinates in and go. So you can type them in manually or you can go off to one of these services. Next up is when you actually run this target, what do you want it to do? You know, if you are starting out, um, like say this is the first object of the night, are you already parked on the object? Are you, um, you know, where are you? Is this gonna be a second object for the night? I guess you gotta plan it out in your head, but you can have it automatically slew in center. Now remember there was some centering stuff. Um, you can slew to the object. If you're really confident and you have a super accurate mount, you could just slew and not even deal with centering because you know it's gonna be within a couple pixels. Or you can just say, check that box and it's just gonna start it up and just start going basically. Um, if you're gonna have like in this example here, I have like for instance, what I typically do is I usually get everything going at the beginning of the night because I, you know, I like to, you know, feel like I'm imaging. So I start off the night and the first object I typically have is set for do not move to location. I will actually use the two buttons there on the side and actually slew to it and then do a center myself man, by, by those buttons and it'll actually manually do those actions. And, but then after that, once it's done, like M42, I do have it set to slew and center. So once I hit, and once the California number nebula is done and, it, and it's on a time constraint, once it hits that time constraint, it automatically slews over to M42 for me and centers it up for me and does all that fun stuff. Um, so that's what that slew and center is. Slew and center is super important if you're gonna be doing odd, multiple objects per night and you don't have a super, super accurate mount. If you have an all sky model and it's gonna be within arc seconds, yeah, you can do away with without the centering. But most people, I would recommend the slew and centering. Your time constraints is a really handy thing to have. You can say, I want this particular, you can actually hit the start, uh, um, run sequence button, but the first object you have checkbox doesn't start till a particular time. You can actually have it set up so it waits until astronomical uh, twilight, you know, uh, ends and night begins, and then you have it set for slew and center and it actually moves it off as soon as it gets dark out and does all its stuff. And you can have it autofocus, do all that fun stuff. Um, so you can have it start. Um, and nice thing is, is it's with these coordinates, it'll know what the altitude is. So a lot of times I'm looking at what the altitude is and what the time is. I typically don't like the image below, you know, like 45 degrees if I can help it. If it's an object, it's already like Orion, it's already low. I just kind of go with it. Or if I'm going for color data, I'll go as low as I can just because it's not the sharpness I'm dealing with. Um, my luminance, I try to keep it as high as possible. So I'll, I'll use my time constraints to say, okay, I'm done for the night for this, for, 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 for this particular night, I'll move on to another object. So it becomes really handy. And then the planning tool, if you click the planning tool, it'll actually show you a graph that shows the, the um, altitude um, graph of the object. And you can actually go on there and actually click your mouse and it'll populate these things for you. And you can go in there and, you know, click around. Um, and, like I said too, you know, if you have a rotator, you can go in here and tell it to rotate to a predefined um, angle if you already know it. So that's really handy. Oops. Um, let's see here. So that handles your target. So and then you just define how many you want. Um, as long as they're checked, then it's gonna. And you have enough night to do it. Obviously, if you if you uh, set it up and it's gonna take you know, 30 hours, you might not get to the next one you know, for that given night. But if you have the time constraints set up and it's set up to, you know, it's gonna end and you're gonna still have darkness and the next one can run and it's up, it'll go off and do it. And you can handle multiple objects that way very easily. Um, I've done that very well. I really love that feature. Um, I'm trying to think here. Uh, next up here is the um, uh, sequence data, the top middle here. What directory do you want stuff to be dropped into when it, as, you, as you're saving stuff? Um, it's just the directory, it's just where you wanna put it. You know, this is basic stuff. Um, I always put it in the same spot. Um, your file name, this is the, if you go back to your um, manager, you can also, you could change it here too if you want it to be slightly different than what's defaulted. Um, 
these little glasses, that's a preview thing. So it'll actually pull up. It'll take actually everything you have here right now and say, hey, M42 wide. It'll actually build out and give you an example of what it's going to look like. So you can also you can make the tweaks if you want. Um, your user profile, you can see I live in Vicksburg. Basically, the user profile, you put you put in like your longitude, latitude, your altitude, some basic information. And mostly that kind of stuff gets put into the FITS header of your files for you automatically. That's basically what it's used for, um, your user profile, which is handy because if you are, I have a profile for Vicksburg. I have a profile for where I have my, uh, my camper up north. Um, if you go to a star party, if you have a dark spot up north, it's a good place to put it so that your FITS files are automatically populated with the correct information. Um, your equipment, obviously on the top right in this, um, is where all your gear is connected, um, the, the connect stuff. So my right now my camera is not connected. I would hit the little gear icon on the far right, click, 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 and you go down the list. There's a little blue bar right here that expands it even further because there's more gear at the connect. You just go down there and it turns it all on. Really basic stuff. You can tell whether it's, if it's gray, it's not connected. If it's that orange color, it's connected. Um, and it bases off the rule, like with my camera. Once I connect it, it starts to cool automatically. Um, if I unconnect it, it just turns it off basically too. Um, trying to think here, delay options. These are handy. So you have delay and you have event orders. Delay, that's gonna handle like when you first start it, you know, do you, like for instance, your HL, I was here, my, my blue filter. When I start this thing up, do I want it to delay a certain amount of time, like 10 seconds? Or even more importantly, delay between frames. Do you wanna have a certain delay between frames? I don't have a delay between my light frames, but like when I'm doing bias and dark frames, I actually do put a, a delay in there for, for especially like bias frames. I, I'm trying to think of why I did that. I got into a habit a few a number of years ago where I just put a little delay in there just to kind of, I don't say give it a breather, but I just put a small delay in there just so it's not like bias frame down with bias frame. You know, you can set up something like that so you can, you know, kind of put some kind of delay in there. Um, between frames or even at the beginning of the frame. I don't know why you would do it in the beginning. You could maybe set it up for 10 minutes if you wanted to. Um, event order. So these are your events. The, the events are what's being run within your target. So and your events would be, obviously here it's all light frames. It could be your calibration frames. It could be your flats, your darks, your bias. Typically it's all lights. Do you wanna run through all the events? So top to bottom. You know, it's just going to run, well, for instance, here, blue. Um, I got, you know, I'm on two of 10. I have to finish all my blues before I go on to the green, before I go on to the red. Or if I have it set for, um, or actually, no, yeah, finish entire events first, and then there's rotate through events. If I have it on rotate, it's going to shoot a blue, and then it's going to shoot a green, and then it's going to shoot a red. And then it's going to go back and whatever's checked, it's going to rotate through whatever's checked. So it's going to ding, 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 until let's say, like for instance, in this series, I had a whole, I had a whole bunch, I had a whole bunch of H alpha. So I had 41 of these, 50 of these, blah, 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 two, you know, tens of these. It Once I ran out of the, of the, of the red, green, and blue, I wouldn't have to shoot these anymore. I would still start rotating through these other ones. So it can be handy if you're like maybe shooting like a comet that's moving fast and you kind of want to get through it. Or maybe you're doing, you know, to, you're trying to get as much color data as possible. You, you know, you're not going to know how much you're going to have and you're going to be cloudy for the next week or so. You just want to get your RGB and maybe to see what you got to work with. Shoot, shoot it, have it cycle through. Um, and you know, RGB, RGB, RGB. Maybe you have 10 of each frames after a night. Um, or are you going to stick with, you know, there's, it's there for a reason. Um, oh boy. Uh, target events. I'm going to try and see here. Light frames, define filters. Okay. Yeah. So your events here, you can move them up and down. There's these little arrows up and down. You can adjust them. Um, your run, you can check them. When you check them, obviously that makes them run. 
you can pick your type drop down for switches between lights, flats, darks, bias, your filter checks, suffix. If you want to put a suffix on there, you can type it in. Obviously, exposure length, you pick your binning, your repeats, and it shows you the progress of where it is. Um, and then it tells you um, how many there are. You know, it kind of gives you an overview. Um, if you hit the um, the um, the little gear button for an event, it brings up these uh, this box down here in the bottom right here, and you get some options for do. So you can um, like pre-event options or post-event options. It gives you some options to like park your telescope, pause the sequence, and put a message up. You know, run autofocus on resume. I mean, you can do a whole bunch. Run scripts. You can change the event gain. That's handy for like CMOS cameras. So if you want to have a different um, gain or an offset for a, at a particular event level, you can change those down at the event level. Um, so that's really handy for there. Um, like the pre and post events, those are handy for like maybe you have, maybe you're going to be doing flats or something and you need to put like the, um, like you got to, Park the telescope up. You run a script that parks, points the telescope straight up, and then you got to pause it and put a message up saying, "Hey, put the light, uh, the flat field box on top." And then when you're done, you know it'll actually have a box that says, "You know, check, you know, click it when you're done." You know, it, you can do that kind of stuff. So there's some options there to do that kind of stuff. So yeah, so each event you have that option to do that with. So most people will probably be using like it for the CMOS for the event gain and the offsets. You could be doing that down there. Um, possibly because the park telescope, you can typically do your parking, your telescope at the end of the sequence as configured elsewhere. But I suppose you could do it here too. Um, I'm just trying to think here. Uh, sequence options um, up here on the top right. Uh, right below the, uh, the target area, there's a little X and then there's like, looks like a, I call it a cigarette. It looks like a cigarette to me. Anyway, you click that and it's your sequence settings. Um, you can have it, you can put hard stops and sequence at, hey, I want the sequence to end no matter what at end of astronomical twilight. It is going to be at 5 a.m. or whatever. You know, disconnect all my equipment when the sequence ends. You know, run the script, um, run before restart, you know, there's just some stuff that you can, for this particular sequence that you can configure or some, you know, stuff or run non-light, run non-light subs, even if the sequence fail. For some reason, some things blow up, you know, maybe you have a auto guider failure or clouds move in, but you still want to, you know, maybe it's half a night and you know the clouds might, you know, hose the session, but you still want to collect your light frames or, I mean, excuse me, your flat fields. It'll go off and do your calibration still. So you're holding, you know, you still got those to be due. Um, I'm just trying to think here. Any questions on that? I know that's a lot to dig into for that. Um, like I said, this is really your game plan for the night. Um, top to bottom for your targets and then within the target, what are you going to do for your, you know, luminance or your color filters, your H alpha, um, all that fun stuff. Okay, and obviously you can see here, it, it gives you um, time remaining. For like for here, I had two hours and 22 minutes left um, and all that stuff and just run sequence. You can add more too, just add new events. You can keep adding more. You can keep adding more things, adjust things up and down. <clears throat> okay, uh, we're getting into the home stretch here. Uh, sequence recovery, uh, you know, you got to kind of plan for being automation, especially if you're sleeping or if you're really brave like me and you're out of town and you still want to fire this thing up and take pictures. I've done that. I was like, I was down at Disney World and said, you know what? I'm going to try this. I'm going to be brave. I'm going to image why I'm in Disney World. I'm going to be, you know, 1800 miles away from my telescope and observatory. Let's see what happens. Got to have your confidence that there's going to be recovery options and whatnot. Um, so like, you know, what happens, you know, when you're, you lose your auto guider, you know, your auto, your auto focus scene is going to fail. You're going to have meridian flips fail, clouds. Most of the time it's going to be cloud failures. A lot of times clouds cause problems, a lot of problems. Uh, cable snags have caused many problems. Uh, clouds are a big one. But, but like, what do you want it to do? And 
uh, restart sequence when you know uh, you know when when conditions are safe. Obviously, there's these always. Oh, excuse, bleh, sorry. Um, the biggest thing we want to do here is is how to handle it. Um, how aggressive is sequence generator pro going to be with trying to recoup, you know, recover? And so the very bottom one is the checkbox, and it says how many attempts you know, attempt recovery every X amount of minutes for X amount of time. So for me, I said, hey, for the next hour, once, if I lose my auto guider, my guide star, you know, cloud comes in there, it's super thick and I lose my guide star, it'll say guide star loss and a box will come up and say, you're in automatic recovery and it's gonna wait five minutes. And when five minutes elapses, it's gonna go into and says, it's going to try to reacquire the guide star. And if it doesn't, it's going to go, I couldn't do it. It waits another five minutes, tries again, tries again, so on and so forth. And it's going to go for, for me here, one hour. And if after an hour, it says, yep, that's it, I'm done. <laughs> and then if it's done, after that hour, it'll actually close up my observatory and that's it for the night. If it, for some reason, it, it, you know, it was a passing cloud or a bank of clouds, it just starts going and does its own thing. And I wake up in the morning and I see, hey, look at that. There was, you know, some clouds from one o'clock to one thirty, but the thing recovered for me automatically. Um, so, so that's really, I think that's probably the biggest re sequence recovery thing that you can have configured. The most important one, at least to start off with, is to have that checkbox set up and have have it try about every five minutes. I think if you do it anytime sooner, because clouds don't move that fast if they're moving that fast you probably have a storm and you got bigger problems to deal with um and do you how long do you really want to be trying to do it i mean it's totally up to you you can have a try for three four or five hours it depends you know there's some options to say hey when it hits five o'clock in the morning this you're, you're done for the night but you can have i have it set for an hour i figured after an hour if it's if it's not going then my night's probably hosed anyway so that's a real one um I have my sky alert, so I do have it restart sequence when the conditions are safe. So I have it so it's monitoring the clouds actually. So maybe there's two ways. I mean, if you don't have a, a like a sky alert, your auto guider makes a really good cloud detector. It's probably even better cloud detector than the infrared one because it's or like a real. I mean, it's if you lose your guide star, that's it. You're done. That's probably a well. It's either a tree branch or a cloud. So, but I have it set up for there. Um, and then capture calibration frames, even if the sequence fails. Um, yeah, you could have that checked. If For me, I have all my calibrations. I, I spend one night, uh, like every twice a year doing calibrations, so I didn't really need it. Um, uh, yeah, so that's probably the biggest thing that you can do um, for sequence recovery is, is, is have that. Um, and that's going to be in your... I'm going to switch over to here real quick. If you go into tools and you go into options and you go into sequence options and it's right here. And this is where it's all at. <clears throat> and obviously the uh, options for like delay options and all that stuff's right here. But that's, a, that's an important one to have. That's actually saved the I don't want to say saved me, but it's it's resumed imaging for me a number of times through 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 the years. Okay. Okay, so that's I think that's about it. Um, summary. Um, each area is super important. I mean, it, it's I mean whether it's your auto guiding, your your plate solving, your auto focusing, you really need all those pieces working together and working very consistently to work well, um, you know, to move on and, and collect, you know, data. I mean, this M82 was like, I believe that was like 30 some odd hours over like five nights, my M42 here, or my horse head, that was a two, three nights worth of work. The Gotta bail. switch back to your summary slide, Pete, we can't see it. <laughs> oh, oh man. See, I'm getting tired, I need coffee now. See, this is why I need automation so I can sleep. So anyway, so my M82 here, that's like, that was like a, I believe that was like 30 some odd hours. Automation did it. I mean, all these things are, are 20 plus hours, 20 to 40 hour range, somewhere in that range. Automation, 
got me back to it each time, centered up, autofocus, you know, whether it's uh, the, um, the eight inch Richie to my wide field setup, the autofocuser handled it, the plate solving handled it. Um, they, they all work together. And when you hit, once you get, you know, get it all configured, um, you can feel confident, you know, that, hey, you know, this is gonna work, whether you wanna go to sleep at night or you wanna, you know, get your setup going, you know, do some visual observing or whatnot. Um, and you just kind of kind of got to work on it and then find out what your weakest link is. Um, you know, there, there's things that you can always do. I mean, obviously you might have, maybe your mount's the weakest link. Maybe you got to do a tune up. Uh, maybe you've been thinking about getting a new mount or, you know, you need a better auto guider. Or, you know, there's always going to be something, maybe a loose screw, cable management, cable drags. You know, you can have a, a cable drag and all of a sudden your auto guider goes out, out, out the window or when you do a meridian flip. You want to make sure your cables are under control when you have meridian flips that are automatic. I mean, there's this, everything is, you know, works together and um, you really do want to have everything working um, as smoothly as possible. So using moonlit nights to start working on, you know, getting your autofocusing very consistently, um, making sure that's all solid, you know, you got that all good. Um, your plate solving is very consistent. You can point anywhere you can and it, it just works. Um, those are good nights to get that stuff going. Um, and then, yeah, take advantage of the automation. Let it collect. Then, then you can really pour the, pour the hours into an object easily. You know, you can go from a couple hours per object to whatever you want. I mean, I know some people don't want to put 30, 40 hours into an object, and that's fine. But you can go to 10 hours or 20 hours or, you know, you can return to it night after night or maybe, you know, do whatever you want. You could just, you could do a couple hours per object, but you could have, uh, you could do the Messier Marathon in one night, just program the whole entire sequence and start it up and think, 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 think. And, you know, there's just so much you could do with automation. Um, you can definitely maximize your night um, and still let you... Uh, you know, and, and sit there and watch it. I, many nights I'll just sit there and watch it and watch the data come down. Um, well, thank you everyone for attending this. Um, if you want to reach out to me, obviously um, I'm in the Kalamazoo Club um, Astronomical Society, I'm at pmumbauer at hotmail.com or P, P. Mumbauer is my astrobin. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Um, I'd be more than happy to help you out if you have any questions or you're having any struggles with your uh, sequence generator pro. I'll do team viewer um, setups or, or you know help any kind of you know virtual uh, session to help uh, help diagnose issues with this with this um, software. Um, it, it's definitely um, revolutionized um, my imaging and even my uh, the quality of my images for sure. I got one more question there, Pete. Yeah. Uh, where would I go to change that time for the autofocus? Say I'm at 14, I want to bump it up. How, where do I get to do that at? Um, I mean, for like focusing your, like say your H alpha filter? Just the autofocus in itself, the time exposure for when it's doing its thing. When it's autofocusing, you get, I'm taking 14 second pictures. Yeah. Yeah, that's going to be, if you go to your filters tab and you go to set filters, it's going to show all your filters and there's an AF, ex, AF exposure. So I'm going to share my screen over here real quick. So if you go to your filters tab on your equipment profile manager, Okay, there it, there it is. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And that's where you'll want to do it. Now, if you pull up a, if you're using a sequence up here on the right, you know, there's the little, the little uh, yep. the twisted arrows. That's your sequencer. That brings up your whole plan. Yep. The one next to it's your control panel. This is the active equipment manager. This is what's actually running your this is what's actually being used if you go to your filters there and you click the define filter list that's going to tell you actually okay. open up that one because 
more likely if you if you keep using the same sequence file and you'll keep saving it and just like delete old file names and you know target names and just keep reusing the same file um, um, this is where you're going to put your um, autofocus exposure otherwise like I said the equipment manager is more like defaults and then your control panel is like hey what is this one really using because um, you, you can tweak things here but yeah right here this is what it's going to use because if you have that one box checked not checked where it's not using a different filter it's going to it's going to use these values for whatever filter you're okay. using So like for the H alpha, you'll, you know, yeah. switch it up to whatever you don't want to put it up to. Anyone else, any questions or? All right, thank you, Pete. Oh, I have a question. Sure. Um, hey, Pete, I've got an AP 900. Mm -hmm. And I've never been able to figure out how to put limits so the scope doesn't hit the pier while it's imaging. Um, I, I do mostly variables, so. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, Are you using uh, APCC at all or just the ASCOM um, V2 driver? Just the ASCOM V2 driver. Okay, so but you, you do have issues of running into the pier? It's never happened. I don't want to. Happen. Oh, okay. It's never happened. Okay, that's good. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Um, what kind of scope is it? Like a refractor or a Schmidt? Uh, I've got a Schmidt on there now. I've had a reflector on there in the past, so I I swap scopes over there. Okay. Um, as far as limits, do I need to buy APCC to do that? Yeah, APCC is actually gonna have um, actual limits. That that actually does have limits, and I do have limits in my APCC setup for my 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 eleven my eleven hundred mount. But that's the only spot I can put limits. There's that functionality is not in um, Sequence Generator Pro, but yeah, it's in the APCC. Um, and I'm just trying to think of whether it's in. It should be in. I think you can do it with the standard because there's standard and Pro for APCC. Um, I believe standard has the limits. Uh, I guess you can want to check the feature list. Okay. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, yeah, that's kind of, I was hoping I didn't have to buy APCC. Yeah, I'm just going to pull it up here real quick. Uh, maybe, we'll see. Hmm. Let me see if I got doesn't load up real fast. Uh, um, okay, I gotta see here a minute. Yeah, I got limit. Uh, I don't have the limits turned on right now. Oh yeah, here's my limits. Yeah, um, yeah, I got pro. I'd have to. Yeah, you, I, I would check to see if you, because if you can, if you just need limits and you could do the standard, I I would do that because it's definitely quite a bit less than the pro. Um, yeah. But I know for sure that that function is not in Sequence Generator Pro. Yeah, it looked like the horizon limits were there on the hand panel. But the beer limits were not. But thanks, I, I appreciate that. Good presentation. That was yep. great. Okay, thank you. All right, anybody else? All right, here and none, we're going to move on. So again, thank you, Pete. That is a great deal of yep. information. I just want to remind everyone, of course, Pete offered to give his uh, PowerPoint presentation, but if you want all the details behind the PowerPoint, don't forget, uh, this uh, meeting will be on YouTube. I'll probably have it on the YouTube page uh, probably as early as uh, late tonight or early tomorrow. So you can watch this at your own pace and study it, analyze it, 
and uh, set up Sequence Generator Pro to your liking. So it is getting kind of late here. Uh, Pete did squeeze in a lot of stuff in there. So we're going to rush through the agenda right. really, really fast. Uh, but did anyone have any uh, new images from the past month that they wanted to share really fast? Okay, here are none. We're going to move on there. Um, I know, I know Pete had some, but maybe we'll try to catch up uh, next month too. Uh, since this is uh, current news, I wanted to um, share my screen here. Of course, we'll go to the all sky camera. You can see the, the moon out west is uh, quite overwhelming. Let me um, switch to the proper tab here. And of course, uh, Comet Leonard is all the rage right now. Everyone's trying to see it. Of course, I haven't seen it because I live in Michigan and the weather here is terrible. But uh, about a week ago or so, uh, Comet Leonard passed by M3 in Keynes Venetici. And here's the astronomy picture of the day for December 12th. And this was taken by Dan Bartlett. And it's just probably the most remarkable image of the uh, encounter that I've seen so far. So yeah, you can see Comet Leonard and M3 here and just uh, wonderful detail. So there's a great image from another astrophotographer. Wow. Anybody else have any uh, uh, images from other imagers you uh, saw recently that you wanted to share real quick? If you have them handy, if not, we'll uh, hold off till later. Richard, I have another one similar to that. I can show real quick. Okay. If I can share here a second. So this one was very similar, but he also captured a meteor at the same time, which I thought was pretty, Oh wow! Cool. Like, like a one in a million kind of shot, right? I mean, here you are trying to capture a comet going by a, a Messier object, and then you get this beautiful meteor passing through at the same time. So I thought that one was pretty easy. I think this guy's name wow. was Terry Hancock. I saw it come up on Facebook. Oh, yeah. So. Terry, oh, Terry Hancock. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's a great really... imager. We had him as a speaker once and uh, never, never again. He's a terrible speaker. <laughs> <laughs> but... he, used to, he used to live in Michigan. He did. He did. Yeah, we, we did have him as a guest speaker and everyone kept saying, I can't hear the guy. I can't hear the guy. So, uh, so yeah, we, we, we never had him back. Uh, but boy, boy, is he a good imager, but, but not a great speaker. <laughs> uh, moving on. Um, anybody have any new astrophotography related equipment that they... Uh, got recently did or or did anyone buy any of the great gifts that we listed last month <laughs> i got a new objective lens does that count <laughs> oh got... right yeah yeah you got the new <laughs> lens for your refractor right yeah yeah that counts yeah okay so i know we're running along here so again i just wanted to mention i, I just still have this on the agenda if you are an astrophotographer and you currently mm. do not have a uh uh gallery on the website you know the, the kalamazoo astronomical society website uh, um, i strongly encourage you to uh, send me images with you know short captions of how you created the images you know just the basic back background information and i can put together a astrophotography gallery for you you know the bigger the website the the better so i want to have lots of stuff there a uh, quick update on the kas remote telescope it's been getting uh, pretty light use lately, which is kind of uh, disappointing. But, you know, right now we have the moon. It's been a little cloudy out there, as you saw on the uh, all skag camera real quick. And um, a great deal, many of you have to renew your subscription to the remote telescope. I'm way behind on uh, sending out a reminder email about that. But I might, at this point, now just wait till the first of the year. Um, so, so if you are currently... Uh, uh, signed up to use the remote telescope. Uh, you'll probably hear from me shortly after the new year that says uh, it's expired and it's time to renew. I hope you do renew uh, because again, we need people to pay for the telescope to help maintain it. And we want to get people to use it. So, you know, I created the training video, a user manual. We can do, um, you know, mentorships and stuff like that to again encourage people to use the remote telescope i know a lot of you have your own equipment but frankly ours is better and it's under much better skies far superior than anything we have around here so uh and of course it's, it's cloudy around here so if you can't use your own equipment here in michigan and you really want to image one night but it's cloudy why not try to use the remote telescope if it's available? So, so go ahead and do that. Because one thing we might do here pretty soon, if more members don't start using the remote telescope, is we're going to open it up to people outside of our region. And, you know, 
out of state and stuff like that. And um, just to get people using the telescope and I would prefer to keep it local. Uh, we did get our new auto guider. We, we got the uh, ZWO ASI 174MM mini auto guider. Um, Jim Kurtz sounds like he's going to take a uh, trip out to ASV for the holiday season, and he's going to get that all set up for us. That's just one less thing on my plate. So uh, thanks to Jim for taking care mm -hmm. of that for me. And um, again, if you like to image in person, you know, you like to be with the telescope and don't like to do the remote thing or something like that. Uh, we do have our observatory available. You can use it for planetary imaging or deep sky imaging. We don't have all the wonderful hardware we need to do like automated imaging where you can just kind of click a button and go sleep in your car for a while or something like that. We're not quite there yet. We need more contributions to do stuff like that. And um, I, as uh, Henry found out uh, recently, I take the uh, the observatory laptop home for the winter because I use it during the uh, online viewing sessions as well. And I told Henry, you know, to email me if he was definitely going to go out yesterday and he forgot to do that. So he went out there without telling me. And of course, there's no computer out there and uh, he, he couldn't do anything. But it got really windy a short time after he was out there anyway. So uh, don't forget, we have the observatory available. There's no extra fee to use it. You just have to take the training session. Uh, so quick um, uh, preview for next month. Our uh, special guest speaker is going to be Bruce Waddington. And he's one of the, not creators, I would say, but the maintainers or coordinators or custodians for PhD2, the auto guiding uh, program. And he's going to be uh, giving a introduction to auto guiding. The, uh, the, the, the working title is an introduction to auto guiding, but I still have yet to get the actual title and uh, description of his presentation from him. And I'm hoping to get that real soon because I want to get that uh information so I can get the newsletter done because that, that would be wonderful to get it done before the holiday. So uh, that'll be on January 21st at again, eight o'clock. And I hope you can all join us because we got to keep the attendance around minimum 25 to really justify inviting guest speakers. So we need people to attend these meetings, especially when we have guest speakers. Otherwise, I'm not going to invite them and we just might not continue the SIG. So it, it depends on members participating. Uh, so, 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 so I just wanted to mention that. Uh, if, if no one has anything else, if, if nobody wanted to mention anything, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, officially call it a night. So thanks for uh, joining us. And again, thanks to Pete for the uh, incredibly informative presentation.